Welcome everyone to our second PSCNN Zoom webinar, and thank you very much for joining us. I am Dr. Mindy Lakshan. I am the chair of the Parkinson Support Center of Northern Nevada. We are a relatively new nonprofit and currently the only one serving the Parkinson's disease population of Northern Nevada. We were founded just over a year ago. We have a dedicated all volunteer board. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for those living with Parkinson's disease, their families and care partners in Northern Nevada with our goal to connect people to the information, support services, programs and activities they need to enhance wellness and to live an active and engaged life. Some bookkeeping type things for our webinar, if you get disconnected, go back to your email, click on the link and sign in again. This webinar is being recorded and will be on our website in the next week or so. Dr. Ellis will speak for approximately 40 minutes and then she will be taking questions. If you have a question, feel free to post at any time in the Q&A box. Just hover on the bottom of the screen, click the Q&A button and type your question. We'll try to get to everyone's question during the Q&A period. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Ellis. Dr. Ellis is Associate Professor at Boston University College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences in the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training. Her research focuses on investigating the impact of exercise and rehabilitation on the progression of disability in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Dr. Ellis is also the director of the Center for Neurorehabilitation at Boston University, where she conducts research, provides clinical consultations and education to healthcare professionals and to persons with neurologic disorders. In addition, Dr. Ellis directs the American Parkinson Disease Association National Rehabilitation Resource Center, which is housed at Boston University. She also teaches examination and treatment of patients with neurologic disorders within the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at BU. Dr. Ellis has her PhD in Behavioral Neurosciences from Boston University School of Medicine. She is a board certified specialist in neurologic physical therapy, and she has published numerous articles and lectures internationally on topics related to rehabilitation in persons with Parkinson's disease. Please welcome Dr. Ellis. Well, thank you, Mindy, for that wonderful introduction. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here and um, and be with all of you today and and share uh, some information on exercise and Parkinson's disease. It's uh, we always get a lot of questions about exercise and Parkinson's, so I'm happy to be here with you and share the latest evidence um, on this topic. So what I'm going to do, as Mindy said, I'll, I'll talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then I'll take questions. So I'm going to share my screen. So this is a common question I get, you know, from many people with Parkinson's disease. What, what impact does exercise have on Parkinson's disease? How do we understand the role? What's actually going on? Um, and you know, over many years, over a couple of decades now, we have benefited from many studies in exercise using animal models, and mostly mice and rats, for example. And I'm going to just very briefly talk about what we've learned from those studies and, and how that might be relevant to people living with Parkinson's disease. So what we've learned from the animal studies basically is that um, those mice or rats um, that have been, you know, induced, they've induced Parkinson's in those mice and rats with a particular toxin. And when they exercise those mice and rats, they see, those scientists have, have observed an increase in what we call GDNF or a neurotrophic factor in the brain. And an e increase in those chemicals, those neuro trophic factors in the brain is thought to be protective. And so what happens is, is when they count the number of cells in the area that's affected by Parkinson's disease, they count those brain cells, there's a preservation of those brain cells 
in the animals who, who participate in exercise, and mostly that's running on the wheel. Whereas uh, there seems to be an increase in the loss of those cells in the, in the rats that don't exercise. So in addition to those, you know, the chemicals that seem to protect the cells, there's also evidence that suggests more dopamine release. So dopamine, which is, you all know, an important neurotransmitter in Parkinson's disease that is lacking, exercise seems to increase the availability and the release of dopamine. So there's more to use when you're, uh, you know, out and about moving in your day-to-day -day life. And then exercise has also been shown to uh, decrease what we call the dopamine transporter or a chemical uh, in, in between the neurons. And so this chemical, the, the job of this chemical is to remove the dopamine. Well, we don't want the dopamine to be removed. We want it to stay there so people can, so the neurons can actually use it. And so exercise in animals has been found to suppress or decrease that chemical. So that therefore more dopamine is available to use in the system. So in a nutshell, these animal studies have looked at, you know, the effects of exercise on the brain of people with Parkinson's disease and highlight a number of different mechanisms that have been shown to be in play that might account for the benefits, you know, that we see uh, with exercise and, and suggest that maybe exercise in these animal models actually modifies the progression of the disease or slows the progression of the disease. So the big question is, well, how does this relate to humans? You know, we know this in animals, but what happens, you know, in humans? And so in this figure here, what we know is that exercise is a, a form of experience. And we know that exercise can influence the neuroplasticity of the brain. So what is actually, what does that mean? So exercise mainly, the, mo the most sort of robust evidence we have, I would say is in the area of aerobic exercise. So cardiovascular exercise in which you are breathing heavy and your heart rate is elevated. There's a couple of things going on with that. There's overall, there's in everybody, there's improvements in overall brain health uh, because there are some, uh, you know, changes that occur in everybody's brain when they exercise aerobically. But in people with Parkinson's disease, these trophic factors right here, these neurotrophic factors, these are the same ones I just talked about in the animal models. So these factors are elevated in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease when they exercise and have a potential protective effect. They're you know, protecting those cells that typically die off with Parkinson's. But there's also just some general, you know, general effects of an increase in blood flow, stronger immune response, and better metabolism overall. So these are sort of some general effects of, of, of uh, you know, the impact of exercise on the brain. Then over here, we have specific kind of um, changes to the way that the neurons uh, communicate. So the way those neurons communicate with each other um, is enhanced in Parkinson's disease. And that has to do with the release of dopamine, or more dopamine availability, like I just described in the animal models. So the combination of these things here uh, lead to sort of improved circuitry. So that area of the brain and the basal ganglia, they call it, or the midbrain, that's affected in Parkinson's disease, there's enhanced communication and overall better function with exercise. And that leads to better behavior, like better, for example, walking ability, less severe motor symptoms. So there is something to the effects of exercise that basically enhance people's day-to-day -day function. And so everybody asks, well, okay, so what, what are the kinds of exercise I should be doing? Well, there are different categories of exercise. It's not just one thing. So there's aerobic exercise, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with all of these, but aerobic exercise, for example, walking on a treadmill or walking outside over ground or cycling or even swimming or boxing. There's components of aerobic exercise in which you're working hard and sweating and difficulty talking while you're exercising and your heart rate is elevated. 
Um, and then there's strength training, you know, things like using weights or machines or, or, or elastic bands that help strengthen muscles. And then there's balance training, for example, that might include things like balance exercises or Tai Chi classes or dancing, for example. And then there's stretching, uh, exercises that improve flexibility or range of motion. And then there's what we call task specific training or working on the specific task that you want to improve, like walking, for example. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna describe each of the each of these in a little more more detail. But I'm also going to describe why are these important in Parkinson's? Because these exercises are important for everybody. But the reasons they're important for people with Parkinson's disease are different. So everybody asks me, well, what kind of exercise is best? Which one of those should I do? You know, is one better than the other? And it's not so much one is better than the other. It's the question is, what is the goal? You know, what is your individual goal? And once we know what that goal is, and then we can tailor the specific exercise to help you meet that goal. So I'll give you some examples as we go. So aerobic exercise, for example. Okay, so walking on a treadmill or walking outside, we know that that improves cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory fitness in everybody, right? People are more fit, their heart is more healthy, when they engage in aerobic exercise. But what's so special about this in Parkinson's disease? Because this is the same kind of exercise that was studied in the rats and the mice, right? And, uh, uh, you know, on the animals. And so in humans, when they try to replicate that kind of a study, what have we learned? Well, one of the biggest trials to date in one of the biggest studies that's been published is a study in which 126 people with Parkinson's disease were randomly assigned to one of three groups. Some people with Parkinson's just continued with usual care. That means just doing whatever they usually do, the same medicines they took before or they're, or they're gonna take or the same care from their physician, nothing new. Uh, and then some people participated in a moderate intensity exercise program. And some people participated in a high intensity exercise program. And they did this for six months, okay, over a six month period, and then they were reassessed. So what did they do over that six month period? Well, people that were in the moderate intensity group, they exercised four days a week on the treadmill at 60 to 65% heart rate max. Basically, that means the heart rate is elevated and people are sweating, but you can still, you know, you can still uh, talk while you're walking. Talking is a little bit difficult, but you can still, you know, have somewhat of a conversation. Um, and in a high intensity exercise program, some people did that four days a week on a treadmill that's at 80 to 85% heart rate max. So that's at a higher intensity. And it's when you're really sort of out of breath when you're trying to walk. And so the question here is, you know, was, is exercise better than usual care? And does there seem to be any difference between high intensity or moderate intensity exercise? And what we learned from that study, so this here on the y-axis going up and down here, is the, the severity of the motor symptoms in Parkinson's. So let's say mostly that's the slowness of Parkinson's. And the usual care group had the most change or the most worsening, about three points on the scale, over the course of six months. And the moderate intensity group had le a little less than two points worsening and the high intensity group had about a half a point worsening. So the only statistically significant difference was between the high intensity and the usual group, meaning that th these results suggest that maybe the high intensity exercise might be important in reducing the severity of those motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So, because of that data, a new study has been launched. It's called the SPARKS-3 trial. 
And there are 29 sites across the United States that are in and Canada that are engaged in this trial. And we're at BU, we're one of them. And so in this trial, there's two groups, people with Parkinson's who exercise at high intensity on the treadmill, and then those that, in, that exercise at moderate intensity. So the same as the other study, on no, except no usual care. So in this study, there's going to be 370 people with Parkinson's disease across the country in Canada that will participate. We've already launched this. Already, there's about 75 people participating. We just launched this, you know, within the last several months. And so let's see, near you, the University of Utah uh, has a site. And, and so they're uh, implementing the study there. If anybody, you know, is interested in inquiring more about that, they're still, we're still enrolling. So the results of this study will help us determine, we already know aerobic exercise is important for Parkinson's, but we're trying to figure out how, what, what's the just right intensity? Does it matter if it's moderate or high intensity? Another question that people ask me all the time is, well, does it have to be walking? Does it have to be on a treadmill? What about cycling? What, what about some other forms of, of aerobic exercise? You know, does the actual mode of exercise matter? And so, there was a study done recently in the Netherlands. It's called the Parkin Shape Study. And they actually compared, they had about 130 people with Parkinson's. So they had one group engage in aerobic exercise, a moderate to high intensity. And they compared that to a stretching group. And so their aerobic exercise was on a, a cycle. So they cycled at home on a stationary cycle. And that was over the same six month period as the SPARKS trial that I told you about. And so what we learned from this study is that there was a significant reduction in those motor signs of Parkinson's, the same as the treadmill study. So the results seem to line up. Basically what this is telling us is that aerobic exercise reduces the severity of the motor symptoms regardless of the mode. So that's, a, that's good news because that means people with Parkinson's can choose what they like. So you, you'll get the same results, you know, hypothetically, if you choose cycling or walking on a treadmill. There might be some other reasons to choose one over the other, which we can mention. People with Parkinson's that walk on a treadmill, for example, they have improved walking also like improved elements of walking, faster walking speed and bigger steps. So the actual features of walking improve when people actually engage in the task of walking. If you remember the list of exercises I showed you on the bottom, there was that task specific training. So an example of task specific training is somebody who wants to improve their walking and so they would engage in a walking activity. So if you engage in a walking activity at a moderate or high intensity, you can actually check off two boxes at the same time, right? You can, you can do test specific training and improve your walking ability, and you can engage in aerobic exercise and reduce the severity of the motor symptoms. So people who have a severe freezing of gait or fall, they might be better off on a cycle because it's safer and they can still be successful at pedaling at a rate to get a moderate or a high intensity workout. Whereas that would be really hard on, on something like a treadmill. So it really has to be personalized. You know, it depends on the goals of the person and it depends on their profile or their capability, you know, to determine the just right exercise program. So I'm gonna move on to strengthening exercises which is another important element and shown to be effective in reducing um, the, the slowness and the stiffness in people with Parkinson's. This was a large, uh, well, medium size, I guess, about 50 people with Parkinson's who participated in this study. And they participated, they went to a gym and participated in strengthening exercises using machines in a gym for 
two years. So they did this twice, twice a week for two years. And then that was compared to a group of people who exercise, but at a very low intensity, like um, the same frequency, but stretching exercises, not a lot of resistance. So very sort of low intensity and, and the program was not progressed in a way like this one was progressed. And so at the end of two years, there was a significant difference between the groups in those motor symptoms that we've been talking about. And so the people who engage twice a week in the progressive strengthening exercises with the machines, they had a slowing of that, you know, motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease compared to the other group. And the same thing happened with um, the sort of strength or the force production of the muscles. So the people who engaged in the progressive strength, strengthening exercises over two years had in, improved strength and compared to the other group. And so again, we have another exercise, another form of exercise strengthening here that is, has been shown to be effective in reducing the severity of motor symptoms and improving the strength of the muscles in people with Parkinson's disease. You know, why is it important to improve the strength it's not so much the strength per se, but it's the ability to turn the muscles on and turn them on faster and more efficiently. And that's what happens when, when people engage in strengthening exercises. And that's really important in Parkinson's because people with Parkinson's have a, the slowness and, the, and a hard time turning on the muscles fast enough. So the strengthening exercise helps with that muscle recruitment and turning those muscles on faster. So then one of the questions is which muscles to target in a strengthening program? Well, the most important muscles in people with Parkinson's to target are the big, what we call extensor muscles. The, the, the muscles in the, in the back here that help with standing up straighter, the big muscles in the legs uh, here, the, the glutes, the, the quads, the hamstrings, uh, the, the muscles in the calf area, these are all sort of the most important muscles to focus on in people with Parkinson's disease. So, so what do we know about stretching, for example? Well, stretching um, in people with Parkinson's disease, I would say this is, um, this, this isn't, this is not, I would say as, this is not going to slow the progression of the disease like the other forms of exercises I was talking about. It doesn't necessarily uh, impact the progression of the disease, but what it does is for people who have a lot of stiffness, it, it's important to maintain the flexibility and the range of motion because that helps with day-to-day -day function. So these stretching exercises, you wanna be sort of proactive in maintaining muscle length and making sure you sort of maintain that range of motion and flexibility to allow more sort of freedom of movement. So there, again, there's different reasons um, why people with Parkinson's should do stretching compared to sort of people without Parkinson's. Um, and you know, again, this is sort of more important for people who have a lot of rigidity or a lot of stiffness. And then there are balanced exercises. So balance exercises, um, you know, these, these exercises don't reduce the severity of the motor symptoms the way that aerobic exercise and strengthening do. But balance training is really important in people with Parkinson's because of the high rate of falling that can occur over time. And a lot of people ask me, well, what are the best kind of balance exercises? And the best kind are, is seem to be the sort of more complex balance training. So what, what do we mean by that? you know, balance training that involves sort of agility, moving in different directions. Some of the balance programs even uh, incorporate a cognitive or a thinking component into that exercise program. You might see here, this person is boxing and this person is here, the trainer is, you know, basically providing commands about, you know, which, which side to hit and which technique to use. And, you know, so that stimulates both the thinking um, and, and some balance training. 
you know, balance training on uneven surfaces here, all these different surfaces outside can be particularly uh, beneficial, uh, you know, learning how to navigate crowds, you know, to feel safe, things like on and off an elevator, you know, which can uh, provoke some instability. So I would say it's, it's best to see a physical therapist, you know, this is true of all the forms of exercise, to determine, you know, what is the best kind of balance training for you? Because you, you want to make sure you, you challenge yourself, but at the same time, you do it safely, you know, so that you don't increase your risk of falling. There are studies that show the benefits of both dancing, for example, and Tai Chi. And so these are pretty rigorous studies. Um, you know, the Tai Chi has been studied over a year, a year. So people were, um, well, in this Tai Chi study, this is six months. This, this was a study actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine several years ago with almost 200 people participating. And basically Tai Chi was, was shown to reduce fall rate and to increase balance more so than the stretching group. The resistance training was also pretty effective at improving uh, balance and reducing falls, um, but you know the stretching not so much, which which is what I would expect. Uh, and then here the the dance class. There's been lots of dance studies. Um, this one was done over the course of a year, showing in you know uh, improvements in those motor symptoms of Parkinson's and better walking and better quality of life. So one of the big questions in the field is when to start balance training. When in the course of the, you know, over, over time, is it best to do balance training? Well, people used to wait a long time or wait until there's a fall or people are falling to really uh, engage in balance training. And although balance training can be effective, you know, once falling has emerged, it can probably be more effective if balance training is starting early. These are two large studies that were done, one in Australia and one in the UK with several hundred people with Parkinson's disease, basically showing that a six month balance program you know, there, there were better outcomes in those people who started balance training earlier, those people that had less disease severity. So I guess the message here is that even if you haven't fallen, and even if you don't think you have balance problems, it's good to incorporate balance training in your exercise program. And then, like I said earlier, you know, this task specific training is important working on the task that matters to you, whether that's walking or getting out of bed or standing up from a chair, uh, it's important to actually work on that task. I'm gonna highlight one particularly powerful uh, way to improve walking. And that's with the use of auditory cueing. I'm sure many of you have tried this, uh, perhaps you know, using a metronome or walking to music or, or singing to yourself or humming or uh, any of those things to try to basically walk to some sort of beat or some sort of rhythm. There are lots of different metronomes, metronome apps that you can download um, you know, on your phone. Here's just a few examples that allow you to then you know, sort of use this metronome as a way to, to walk to the beat. Uh, when you're when you're trying to you know engage in a walking program, so how do you know how fast to walk or how many steps to take? And what these metronomes allow you to do is to count the number of steps that you walk in a minute. So let's say you walk you know 80 steps in a minute, or some people will walk less than that, some people 100 steps. It it, it varies, but let's just say 80. You walk 80 steps. Then you can set the metronome to 80 beats per minute. And then you can sort of entrain or lock onto that beat when you walk. And that helps the quality of your walk. So it helps more to, to, to help your walking be more symmetrical, for you to take bigger steps, for example. And then you can, as you get good at that, you can increase the metronome beats, the rate of the beats to say, 85 or eventually 90 
right? And so then you can walk at a slightly faster pace, right? Which allows you to work on increasing speed while still increasing quality of walking. Now, again, it, it's better to see a physical therapist if you wanna start walking to music or a metronome because it really needs to be tailored to the individual. For example, people who experience freezing of gait, they might need to walk at a slower rate because walking at a slower rate encourages bigger steps and then bigger steps helps reduce the episodes of freezing. So again, this has to be tailored to the particular profile. Here's just an example of somebody with Parkinson's disease walking with, in this case, no music. And on the right, is music. Okay, turn around right there, Walter, and do that again. With a metronome overlay. And so uh, you can see on the right, the gentleman is walking faster, he has bigger steps, both are arm swing, yeah. showing that the quality and the quantity is my videotape can improve. So what this shows here, this picture shows here, is on the top, these are kind of more erratic steps with real asymmetry and shortened step lengths when someone with Parkinson's disease is walking without a metronome or without music. And on the bottom, what you see is more even steps when they entrain or lock on to that beat. So we know that when people walk to some sort of external rhythm, that the quality of the walking improves. Now, I don't expect you to read this slide, all this little writing, but I wanted to show you that this has been well studied. Every, all the lines right here represent an individual study. So there's a lot of evidence showing that people with Parkinson's disease who walk to some sort of rhythm have, you know, have end up with faster walking speeds and bigger stride lengths. So they take bigger steps and walk a bit faster. So because of this, we are um, engaging in, uh, you know, uh, we are partnering with a company called MedRhythms and they have developed a, sort of um, an algorithm and an approach to using this rhythmic auditory stimulus, we call it, or this auditory cues to help people with Parkinson's walk better. So in this case, People with Parkinson's wear these little sensors here. I'm gonna to try to use my cursor here. These little sensors on the shoe. And then they walk and carry this the smartphone, which has an, an algorithm and a, a specific app in there. And what that algorithm does is it sort of counts the number of steps that somebody takes. And then the phone plays music that you can choose. So you can choose uh, whatever type of music that you like. And based on the number of steps you're taking from the data collected from the sensors, the algorithm will take that music and either stretch it or compress it. You won't even notice this happening, but as they stretch it or compress it, they're basically increasing the number of steps or the tempo of the music and or, or reducing it. And you hear that through the headphones. So you get to listen to music you like and it's being, the tempo of that music is being adjusted to match your gait pattern. And we're doing a study um, that is looking at whether this approach is, you know, uh, feasible and whether people like it and uh, whether it's more beneficial than walking without music. So another, I guess, question that people uh, ask frequently is, well, how much exercise should I do? And in general, you, people uh, should engage in aerobic exercise about three to four days a week at at least 30 minutes at that target intensity. So right now we don't know if that should be a moderate intensity or a high intensity, but nevertheless, the heart rate should be elevated. People should be sweating and working a bit hard. Strengthening should be done two to three times a week. And balance training should also be done two or three times a week. Now, this is where you can combine things. You can combine the strengthening and balance training. 
those things can be easily combined so that you're, you're getting balance training at the same time you're getting strengthening. And this is the benefit of, of seeing a physical therapist who can tailor the program to you. And then flexibility training can be done in those people who, who are really stiff and have a lot of rigidity. And that can be done you know, daily if, if, if helpful. So basically, you know, regular exercise in people with Parkinson's disease matters. This was a study done of over 2,200 people with Parkinson's disease. This was data that was collected as part of a, uh, it, it was collected in a, as part of a large study, it was registry data. So in this particular study, people measured the amount of exercise people were doing at one point in time at baseline and measured their quality of life and their mobility and their function. And then they monitored how much exercise people did over the course of the year and then measured them again after a year. And what this study shows is that those people who exercise at least 150 minutes per week, so basically that's 30 minutes, five days a week of exercise, some form of exercise, compared to those that did less than 150 minutes or none. And those people who exercised at least 150 minutes, at the end of one year, they had better quality of life, mobility, function, cognition, or thinking, and less disease progression one year later. So again, the, the, the evidence for the benefits of exercise are, are strong. So, all right, exercise is great. You, you, I think we've, we've made a case for that. It can really impact the severity of the disease and Parkinson's, but how do you stick with it? it? It can be a long road, right? And that road can be bumpy, it can be curvy, and it can be, you know, have some challenges. So some of the ways that, you know, we, we're doing a study looking at how to optimize adherence to exercise. How do you keep people going? And so one of the things to think about for yourself is, well, why do I want to exercise? What, what is important to me? Uh, what, are, what are my personal goals? What, what do you value in life? For example, um, I want to travel uh, during my retirement. Or I want to be able to, you know, play with my grandchildren, or I want to continue golfing, or or whatever it is. But if you think about what is important to you and what do you value in life, and then start to set, start to engage in exercise and set exercise goals that will help you attain that personal goal and keep coming back to that personal goal, we find that that really helps people with adherence. The other thing is, it's really important to make exercise fun. You know, if, if when, I, when I talk about all these kinds of exercises, there might be some reasons to do one over another, but the bottom line is you have to like it and it should be fun and that will help you stick to it. And the, and the, and the best kind of exercise is the one you will stick to, that's for sure. And then, you know, it's important also if you're not exercising or you're just starting out to start slow and, and to experience success. There's, it's, it's not a rush, it's, it's, it's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. And so, um, you know, figuring out, okay, just doing a little bit more at a time, gradually increasing is, is the way to, to be successful. And then, you know, it's also important to be specific. And, you know, um, all of us have experiences in our lives where we say, okay, next week I'm going to start exercising. Or next week I'm going to do better. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to start exercising. And it doesn't always happen because that sort of statement is very vague. It doesn't have any specific goals. And, you know, so we recommend that people establish a very specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goal or a SMART goal. You know, I'm going to exercise on Monday at 10 a.m. with my neighbor and I'm going to walk for 30 minutes, you know, that sort of thing. Very specific. So this action plan, you know, who are you going to exercise with? What kind of exercise are you going to do? When are you going to do it? Where are you going to do it? And and sort of laying that out ahead of time helps people stick to it. You know, and as you know, there's lots of community-based exercise programs now for people with Parkinson's, rock steady boxing and pedaling for Parkinson's and dance classes and Tai Chi classes. And these things can really help. The camaraderie really helps people stick to it. 
it just you just have to show up at the class and then somebody reads the class and tells you what to do and you get to be around other people who are supporting you and that can be really helpful for some people and then team sports i think you know older people can still engage in team sports and uh you know people probably you know those people who participated in team sports when they were younger can think back about all the benefits of that and again that you know supporting each other helping each other out that camaraderie can really help with sticking to it and then as you know there's all kinds of watches now that you can monitor how many steps you take and how long you've walked and how active you are and those kinds of rewards can also be really beneficial for some so one of the bottom lines is is that people are more successful when they make exercise a habit so making it part of your everyday routine instead of thinking about exercise every day like should i exercise or shouldn't i today just building it in your regular schedule you know you get up you take your medicines you have breakfast you know and then you take a walk or engage in whatever form of exercise you're going to engage in and that way it becomes part of your everyday routine so as i said earlier i think it's really important to build your rehab team to have a physical therapist an occupational therapist a speech language pathologist that can help guide the kinds of exercises that would be best for you whether it's physical exercise or speech exercise for your voice for example and so what we recommend is that people engage in rehabilitation early you know that people get a, you know go see a physical therapist for example early in the course of the disease and then regularly so here in our center we see people over every 6 months over the course of the disease and when they come in we take measurements about the you know of walking and balance and activities of daily living and quality of life and we measure those every 6 months over the course of time and changes in those areas that helps us that helps us alter the exercise program accordingly so every time somebody comes in we decide okay is the exercise program working should it be more challenging should we change something do we need to emphasize more of one form of exercise than another you know depending on what's going on with that person there are uh, the the american physical therapy the american parkinson's disease association has a booklet called the be active and beyond booklet our team actually wrote this uh, exercise book it's available for free on the APDA website. You can download it. Um, and uh, this contains mostly some strengthening and stretching and some balance exercises to help get you started. And then uh, the Parkinson's Foundation uh, now has an infographic here. You can, you can, you can hang this up someplace or, or you know, to remind you and give you some pointers on what are the critical types of exercises that people with Parkinson's should do. And then, uh, like Mindy said earlier, we uh, we have a National Rehab Resource Center here at BU, funded by the APDA. We have a toll-free uh, telephone number and a and our uh, email address. If you if you want uh, to ask any questions about exercise or rehab, feel free to give us a call. And I just want to thank my team here at the Center for Neuro Rehab. They're a great team, and I couldn't do any of the work I do uh, without them. And then I have an amazing group of collaborators across the country who have contributed to some of the work that I have presented. And then I just wanna thank you all for attending and for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. That was uh, a complete and uh, interesting overview of exercise and Parkinson's disease. It's a Dr. lot of information. It's a lot of information and a very motivating way of presenting it. Get our plans. I love the idea that a goal without a plan is just a wish. So yes. we'll make sure we do have our plans. Um, to everybody attending, our Q&A session is beginning now. So please hover on the bottom of your screen click on the Q&A box and type in your questions. And I will be fielding the questions so that we can make sure we get everything that we can. Our first question for Dr. Ellis comes from Bob and asking, can we bring the Sparks 3 to Reno? What would it take to have this be a center? Yeah, unfortunately that's probably 
difficult to do because it requires a lot of planning and a lot of training to get all these centers up and running. But I can tell you that there's a lot of people participating in the study that don't live real close to the centers that are doing this. There, um, a, the exercise program can, most of that can be done on your own, either at home or in a gym. And so we set you up with the equipment you need and all of the instructions you need to do that. So most, there needs to be a couple of sessions at the site to learn how to do the exercise program at the beginning. But the most, the thing that has to happen the most is that people have to come to the center, you know, um, periodically for the assessments, you know, to be measured, you know, and there's lots of measurements, measuring your, you know, the, the, the motor signs here that your neurologist does every time, the UPDRS, and the walk, you know, certain aspects of walking and quality of life. And then there's also DAT scans and blood work. So it's pretty extensive, but we do have people that come and stay in a hotel for a couple of days, participate in the assessments and then go home and keep doing the exercise program. I know that's not possible for everybody, but it is possible, you know, if you want to look into, it looks like the Utah site might be the closest one. Um, you or could or San Francisco there. maybe is closer. Yeah. Okay. San Francisco has another site too. Um, yeah. They might be, you would know a little closer to you. Are there, for the Sparks 3, are there uh, a minimal functional ability that someone yeah. has to have? How advanced? Yeah, so that's a really, really going. important question. The Sparks trial is for people at, at the beginning of the disease, really, and for people who have not started taking dopamine or Parkinson's medicines. So it's really the early stages, you know, before people start medication. Once you're in the trial, if medication has to be started at some point, that's okay. But when we enroll people, we enroll people who have not started medication yet. That's right. a really important question, important yeah, point. That's, there's so many trials that are that way where you have to be yeah. not having had the levodopa carbidopa yet. Yes, exactly. yeah, that's true. Another question was a link uh, for the books. I'm assuming that's the APDA book, oh. which we can have on our website, and we can send out that information with our follow-up emails, thanking everyone for attending. So that Great. will be, we can certainly. Yeah, and that's a, you know, it's a very uh, straightforward book with lots of pictures and, um, it's a great way to get started and to be able to do the exercises right in your home with no cost and no equipment. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a comment from one of our physical therapists saying, thanks so much. Great talk. Great. Another uh, anonymous attendee. What if pain, particularly back pain, is getting in the way of a good workout? Yeah, that's a that's actually a really important question. And we see that quite a lot. You know, people with Parkinson's disease have tend to have quite a few orthopedic problems, you know, uh, affecting either the back or the shoulders, the neck, um, those kinds of things. And what I would, what we do here is we have the physical therapist uh, treat the specific orthopedic problem first and get that under better control and then start ramping up an exercise program specific to Parkinson's disease. So what I would recommend is that you see a physical therapist specifically for the back pain, but you need to see somebody who has expertise in Parkinson's also, because just treating the back separate from Parkinson's doesn't always work. Um, and so finding somebody in your area, you know, perhaps the physical therapist on the line here, um, that's, uh, participating could, could offer some, or perhaps, you know, Mindy, you have some resources in your area, you know, physical therapists that can help address that. And gradually while they're addressing that gradually introduce an exercise program under someone's care so that they can make sure that you can tolerate it. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. We do have several, uh, well, the one who responded is one on our on our board who's very involved, but there's quite a few physical therapists who are LSBT and other uh, special training for Parkinson's, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike asked, should pills be taken before or after exercise? What is the best timing for the medication? That's a good question. It depends. Everybody's different. But the bottom line is you want to exercise when you're your best. So your best on, for example, or when you feel like your medications are most effective. Because then you can get the most out of your exercise program. You can do the most, you can move, you know, you can challenge yourself more, you can work a little harder. It allows you to be more successful when the medications are working. You know, so that means that that's a slightly different point for lots of people. But I think for yourself, if you say, okay, what's my best time of day? When do I feel like my medicines are most effective? And that's a great time to exercise. And timing that with when there is a group class available, sometimes a challenge. Yeah, Um, yeah. But that the more options you know of in the community for exercise, perhaps the better it would be for you to be able to find those classes that are available at the time. Right, right. Feeling good. Yeah, I mean, and a, a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people, you know, late morning is a good time, for example. So, you know, finding those classes that are, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning or something is very popular. <laughs> um, some people early afternoon. So it, re- it really depends. But you're right. That's another challenge. Uh, this is a question from a caregiver challenging on the internal motivator. As a caregiver, I try to get my wife to exercise. Is there a magic trick to motivate that internal motivator of the PD person? Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Um, That's a million dollar question, I think. Um, And so, yeah, what we try to do is it's really hard to increase the internal motivator. So what we try to do is build in external things that can help that are separate from the spouse always being the one that to do the sort of prodding and reminding. Um, I had mentioned like establishing a routine. And so establishing a routine for your spouse so that, you know, every day at a certain time following, let's say breakfast, they go for a walk or whatever it is. So that it's not a decision point it becomes a routine, just like you brush your teeth the same time every day or in the same way. You, you want to make it as routine as possible because when it's a decision, it becomes so effortful and people have a hard time initiating that and engaging. You know, reminders that go off on your, on your watch or your phone can help so that that person gets a reminder and knows that that's what it's for. You know, now it's time to do this. So it's a little bit more prodding from other external sources. You know, engaging in a class can help. You're just simply, okay, the class is at 11 o'clock. That's, you know, here we go. You know, um, so getting some of that external structure, I would say, is the most helpful thing. But that's a tough problem. It is a tough problem. But that social engagement often yeah, it's over indeed. that hesitation yeah. for the physical. <laughs> yep, yep, I would agree. Yeah, that's great. Another uh, local great physical therapist saying excellent presentation and thank you so much. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? If anyone has a question, please hover on the bottom of your screen, type it on the Q&A box. And if I don't see any mop, we have one just popped up. Another thank you. (laughs) There we (laughs) go. If there are no other questions, I think we can close the Q&A session. And thank you so much, Dr. Ellis, for your excellent presentation and handling of our questions. I want to thank our board. Also, in particular, uh, Nicole Mueller for her time and patience in doing all the technical stuff in the background. Thank you to everyone who attended and participated in the Q&A. I hope you have new insights into Parkinson's and the value of exercise. We do have one more question. Yes, another 
Thank you. Which is great. Um, we do have a, a big announcement. One, we are holding a movement fair on Saturday, October 1st from 10 to 1 in the morning. The event is free, open to the public, and it is a way to learn more about local physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, uh, fitness experts, rock steady boxing, yoga, tai chi, uh, dance, music therapy, etc. that we have in our Northern Nevada community. This is a place for them to get the word out about what they have to offer and for all our Parkinson's community to learn about what you can do so that you can set your goal and have a plan, have met people that you know that you can connect with, you see their schedules, you pick up their information. We will also be having raffle. It is a free raffle. We are a gambling state, so we would have to get a permit if there was a lot of money involved. So for everybody who shows up and make sure that you're on our email list, you will get a raffle ticket and the opportunity to win one of the many prizes, whether it be a free initial evaluation, uh, classes, things like that. We are also now accepting donations for our organization so that we can continue to bring wonderful webinars like this for you in the future. I have no other questions at this time. I would like to again thank Dr. Ellis. We truly, truly appreciate your generous uh, presentation and your time. And we hope to see you again sometime. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful day and stay cool. Bye-bye. <laughs>